All right, good afternoon. So we're gonna go straight into our next talk. For the we're gonna go straight into our next talk. Hey, all right. So for those who don't know me, I'm John Hobson. I've been a member of this community for many years. Uh, I am here to play the role of the ghost of Christmas future. I'm going to show you dark visions of what lies before you. Um, so this came, this project came out of two sort of que interrelated questions. One was an observation that our senior researchers aren't participating, our senior members aren't participating in the SIG as much as we wish they would. Like we always need more mentors. If you look at the Discord, most of the comments and activities seem to be from fairly junior members. And our seniors are sort of lurking and or gone. And it's sort of interesting whether that was a real thing and whether or not there's anything we can do about that. The other question that led into this is me looking up as someone who's been doing this for 20 years and realizing that all of my mentors were gone. Well, not all, like we have Ramon, we have a, we have a few people older than I am uh, still running around here, but by and large, the people who trained me are gone. And I feel kind of like the last dinosaur looking up and going like, where did everybody go? And so we have two, re so I'm gonna to talk today about sort of two surveys that we did. Uh, one is how the SIGs work out, a survey of current researchers in the SIG and look at how uh, they feel about things and how the SIG is working out for them. And secondly, we reached out to a whole bunch of people who used to be in games user research and are now doing other things and to find out uh, where they went, why they left, and whether they're actually happy over there. Uh, this is going to be a little bleak. Bear with me. <laughs> it's, it's just what you need for Friday afternoon. Um, so to start off with the SIG member survey, uh, this was originally going to be just senior members, but this that felt weird that we were going to tell some people they couldn't answer the survey, and we were having trouble defining seniors. So we just let everybody fill it out and sort of skimmed off the senior, most of the senior responses, although everybody's data is represented. We got about 100, oh, damn it, that's a little tiny screen. Okay, so we got about 100 responses spread pretty evenly over uh, the range of, ex of tenure from juniors up to seniors or principals and directors. Our juniors generally were self-reported less than two years of experience. Our directors and principals were reporting 13 plus years of experience. So it looks like at least self-reportedly, uh, we have a nice uh, variation in career to look at. To start off with the happy answers, uh, we asked people what they liked about the SIG. And pretty much it's what you've experienced here today. Like it's the community, it's the knowledge sharing. It is the fact that such a large swath of this profession is all in one discord, all in one room here today. Uh, and this is a special thing. A lot of our early members came from academic backgrounds where they were used to knowledge sharing and they brought that with them into this profession. And it's an awesome, it's something that's very unusual in the games industry where we're all so goddamn secretive. Um, but we hopefully come here today and come to the Discord and share what we know. The downside, uh, so we asked people what they didn't like about the SIG. Uh, to start with the, with the right side here first, one of the common complaints we got was that this sort of Discord noise. It's hard to keep up with the Discord. We're all members of like 50 Slack channels. And one more thing, pinging notifications at us is tough to keep up with. And if you mute it and come back in a week or two, a lot of the times it's, it feels overwhelming. There's a million channels lit up. So there's probably something to be done there. It's working really well. We have an active SIG Discord, which is not a small thing. Uh, but there's probably something we could do to make that sort of better curated for people who drop in and out. It's this left side that's sort of the problem is we get a lot of comments that the people speaking up on the Discord are juniors. That when we look at the activity, it's things like uh, portfolio reviews and resume reviews. Those are wonderful things. We should be doing those, but that doesn't really benefit the more experienced half of our community. When we asked people sort of more directly, like what they did in the SIG, the top two things were they looked on the Discord and read messages and they come to this conference. Those are wonderful. Like those are genuine accomplishments that most SIGs in the IGDA don't have, but other act, but we have two pillars we need more. Uh, I love the fact that LinkedIn is way down there at the bottom. It's, it's still there, but it's 
sadly neglected um, or justly neglected. When we asked people how important things were in the SIG, uh, these activities were to them. So we had one is not at all important. Five is very important. This conference was super important, obviously, duh. Uh, the salary survey you just saw has been a huge resource, although more for juniors and seniors, but usually by the time people make sort of staff or whatever, they figured out what they're worth. Uh, the Discord server, hugely valuable. The mentoring program was much more valuable to our juniors and our seniors, obviously. Uh, so that would, for juniors, that was one of our most important things, but for the seniors, less so. Uh, LinkedIn, again, is down way down at the bottom. And social events, the most common response we got when we asked about social events was, we have social events? Uh, and we do, it's just they've been inconsistent and we have to, we're a multinational organization, so there's struggles to find good times to do things and whatnot. Um, we've done some, they've been successful, we need to do more of that and find a way to make that easy and ongoing. But, that, right, but if you look at that, we have sort of four really good pillars there. Uh, we have an active online community, we have a co yearly conference, we have a mentoring, successful ongoing mentoring program, and we have a salary survey that helps people get what they deserve. Those are amazing accomplishments and we should all be really proud that we have them and we're doing them on an ongoing basis. Uh, but for the bad stuff, <laughs> uh, the, the feedback we got from seniors was they felt most of the discussion that was going on on Discord was not for them and that what they really wanted from the SIG was private communications with peers, was to have private conversations, the equivalent of going out for drinks with, a, with peers at, after GDC and having those candid conversations of which it's kind of hard to have in a semi-public online forum like the Discord. And on one hand, this is a completely legitimate need. Yes, they need those discussions. Those are helpful. We, they should do those. But it is sort of contrary to the spirit of the SIG. Like we're all about community and open knowledge sharing. And then if we did this, if we did this kind of conversation with the SIG, suddenly we have a VIP room that only the cool kids get to go in. And that's that's sort of a contradiction that we haven't resolved yet. And so what we have right now is a lot of our seniors are ending up in like private group chats and having sort of offline events that don't involve everybody. And we don't want to stop them from that, but it would really be nice if we could find some way to fold that into the SIG and make create a fifth or sixth pillar for keeping this community all in one place and benefiting each other. Uh, because if the seniors go away and do their thing in another space, that means they're not going to be there to answer junior questions on the Discord. It means they're not going to be coming to this conference to present. It means they're not going to be showing up to be mentors. So we need to find some reason for them to be involved and figure out a way to channel that. So this is sort of the halfway point. Before I go into the next survey, I wanted to take a minute and answer questions about this so far and hear suggestions about this so far. No. This is all completely correct. Yes. Oh, yeah. Hit me. Maybe not. I mean, this may be just a human thing that sort of any human organization is going to have sort of weird little cliques and clubs at the high end. And that's fine. But it does mean that those seniors are probably checking into the Discord less often. They're probably showing up to the conference less often because the talks are probably less relevant. Like that may start out set off a cycle. If we don't find at least some way to channel into the SIG, we may set off sort of a cycle where this ends up being the junior researcher club, which would be sad for the junior researchers too. Yeah. So, uh, so I sorry, I wasn't doing the good uh, online conference thing. So the question was, uh, would, would it help to do an organized time for seniors to do this, where they had sort of a discrete moment? And I think yes. I think the tricky part is how do we structure that time? Do we say like, okay, there are private channels that you only get to be in if your title is a certain thing or above, is or a certain number of years of tenure? Like, could we really guarantee privacy on those? 
it is an online forum. So like the exact logistics of how you do it seem to matter. Oh, Nikki? <laughs> okay. And so, uh, uh, Nikki's comment was that there may be we might have defined times for seniors to come and help juniors and answer questions, less to interact with each other's peers, but with help the community. And yes, that would be awesome. That's something we should do. It does end up relying on altruism again, without sort of a natural seniors are coming there for their own benefit. And I think we should probably have some good answer to why should seniors show up in Discord? Christy? <laughs> The critical comment that we may need to do this from top down. So we we encourage seniors to be in the SIG by having directors in the SIG and the directors are that are resource for seniors and we could have, we could all pull each other up from one rung above. That would be awesome. Yes. <laughs> you should totally do that. Kirk. yeah so uh kirk comment is that as we hit fewer seniors we get more pressure on the existing seniors to be available and get they get more questions and more pressure and it seems to create a self-protecting cycle uh yes like <laughs> that is one of the issues yes Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the comment was that, uh, Please let me know if I've mischaracterized mis this, that we are focusing a little too much on the role and it should be researchers approaching researchers as people and less as sort of juniors pestering seniors for mentoring jobs. Yeah. Okay. One more and then we probably need to go on to the rest of the sad presentation. So the question was uh, whether or not other user research communities have the same problem. I don't know. And I really hope they do because maybe they have better answers than I do. But uh, yes, if anybody has contacts in other areas of research, I would love to hear how they're solving this. Um, you can ask, we can come back to this at the end, but I want to make sure we get to uh, the second half. So the formal researcher survey. Uh, so this is why do people leave game changer research? Where do they go? Are they happier over there? And could we have encouraged them to stay or come back? Um, so I was trying to offset the bleakness. So uh, uh, this half of the deck is uh, breakup song themed. We have a soundtrack. We're going to start with Carly Simon. You're so vain. You probably think this talk is about you. 
uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the steering committee had a chance to stop me and they didn't. So you can blame them. Okay, so before I get into these numbers about retention in, in game change research, I wanna say that as far as I can tell, our numbers are not particularly bad. Like in general, the average person has 12 jobs of their lifetime, switching every four years or so. Uh, it's hard to get good numbers on career change because there's no good definition of what counts as a career change. Uh, for example, to pick a example close to home, our own James Berg has migrated off into uh, accessibility work. Is that a career change? Kind of? Yes? No? So as far as they can tell, just a made up about half of job changes are career changes. So this is pretty common. Uh, a significant fraction of people are looking for a new job at any given time, and most people don't think they're being paid enough. So as I talk about people leaving the leaving this career or complaining about their pay, these are not novel to us. These are not, we are not, as far as I can tell, especially bad, but this job is awesome and it, we should have 100% retention. The same way our game should have 100% retention. My game should have 100% retention. <laughs> Uh, so I reached, so to, there's no convenient pool of former researchers. So I reached, so I reached out to some gurries that I used to know, uh, and did sort of a snowball sample through everybody. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And so I reached out to people I knew who had left the profession and they reached out to other people and we forwarded this along. We ended up with about 30 respondents who had been in game change research for an average of eight years. They've been gone for an average of six years. So they are both have a solid experience in the profession and have had enough time to really experience the consequences of switching out. Uh, to start off again with the happy things, so what do they like about working in games? There are reasons why they will always love games, in the words of Whitney Houston. Uh, games are a fun topic to work on. Our players are fans. They're excited to come into the lab. They're excited to play the games. And as you can see around the room, we have great coworkers. So there are a lot of reasons to like you working games. You all know that you are, that's why you're doing it. For the dislike, uh, however, every rose has its thorn and <laughs> uh, people dislike the pay, a lot of complaints about the money. Uh, the relative immaturity of the games industry was a problem, crunch, and the, the lack of ownership. The fact this is fundamentally an advisory role and an influence role rather than an ownership role. Um, one thing to th remember in terms of the immaturity and crunch, most of these people left on average six years ago. So they their comments may reflect the games industry they left, not the way it stands now. We're a little better. A little better. So we find out, asked them, open-ended, why did they leave games use research? The number one answer we got back was pay. Uh, was people saying that they were able to make 40% more by going off to do other things. Or we also had a lot of people say that um, they left for a promotion, that they hit a, an advancement wall in GUR, and the way they got around it was by leaving games. Uh, we also had, had a fair number of people who said they just it was time for something new. I did 12 years. Again, mostly people had an average of eight years in game future research. That is not a career drastically cut short. So it's perfectly reasonable for someone to say, yeah, I've done this. I'm ready to go on to something else. Once they answered the open-ended, we had them go through a checklist of reasons we'd brainstormed and said, check anything you had apply. Uh, the number one reason people let, said they left is more money, uh, followed by, tied by time to try something new and going for a higher level position. There's a bunch of these that you can sort of bundle together into sort of a meta reason of the games industry is immature, things like bad management, crunch, uh, frustration with the weirdness of the games industry and so on. I'm pretty sure the reason why lack of diversity is so far down is that we didn't have enough diverse people to complain about the lack of diversity. But yeah, uh, but it is pretty much but it pretty much does boil down to pay advancement and novelty seem to be the reasons why we're losing people. Uh, after they said, thank you, next, where did they go? Um, a surprising amount are still in the games industry. Uh, people who've migrated into accessibility, into analytics, into data engineering, things like that. Um, 
we have a lot who are totally gone from the industry and we have a lot who are sort of, we had an, it's complicated option for people who ended up at places like Twitch where is it game, is it in the games industry? Well, it's not, they're not making a game, but they're related. So we gave them a, a way to a weasel answer. They did end up in a wide variety of, of fields. It, there wasn't a clear pipeline to like, okay, everybody goes on from GER to working in uh, Microsoft Office or something. Uh, we did get a lot of answers from Meta and VR, but that may be a sampling bias from people I know. Uh, when we compare uh, their lives before they left and after, about three quarters before they left were below the staff manager level. And after and six years later, about three quarters of them are above that, are staff manager or above. Uh, now it's been six years. Their career might have progressed that same amount if they'd stayed, but according to them, probably not. They seem to be pretty firmly believing that their rates of advancement was better after they left Game Changer Research. Um, one thing I thought was particularly interesting is they didn't overwhelmingly say, oh yeah my new company has such better UX maturity. I was kind of expecting that. I was expecting them to be like, oh yeah, no, I work on Facebook now and they have like brilliant, uh, highly sophisticated user research processes. No, it's actually seemed to be a lot more ambiguous, which is sort of interesting to hear. I think of us as being a backwater, but maybe not. Uh, when we asked if they're actually happier over there, the answer was yes. <clears throat> 70% said they are very satisfied with their decision to leave the games industry. Uh, mostly they're saying like, look, I love games. They're not the only thing in the world. It was the best move of my career. Uh, one person said they've pro progressed their career more in the last six years than the, their first 10 years of the games industry. I do find it interesting that uh, only about a quarter said they would never come back to games. The rest said they would come back, they would stay or come back under the right circumstance. And so I think that's hopeful. There are things we can do. Uh, how do we make them stay? Well, while there is a small set that said they are never ever getting back together, uh, mostly they pretty much reiterated the reasons we've talked about. They wanted, if we've been able to give them more money, if we've been able to let them advance and get promoted, and if we let them vary up their workload, there is definitely a tendency in game user research to get trapped as, okay, I'm just running another weekly play test. It's time to do the same thing again and again. Uh, keeping it varied would have helped. And about 50% said they'd come back if we could match their current salaries, benefits, et cetera, which I think again is pretty hopeful. There were some others who said they'd come back if we paid them more than they're making now, but that may be asking too much. Uh, there are a few takeaways I think you ought to know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's the last one. I promise. We need to get our people for this is mostly for the managers in the room. I'm, I'm looking at that table back there. I can see them, uh, <laughs> including myself in this, but like, we need to get our people paid. Like we've, we've, we all know that games pays less than other professions, but we need to be fighting even harder than we are now. That is the thing that is costing us people and paying our people more is cheap, is much cheaper than backfilling the role and losing all that experience. Uh, we need to give them a pass to advancement. We are way too goddamn stingy about promotions. Uh, I used to be like, just to get personal for a sec, I used to be super proud that everybody on my team could punch above their weight class. That when I hired a mid-level researcher, I'd expect them to win arguments with senior designers that I expect my senior researchers to be able to bully creative directors. Okay, not bully, but you know what I mean? And like, on one hand, it's like, yes, I'm hiring great people and that's awesome, they're performing highly. But on second, it's like, wait a minute, that if I'm expecting them to have influence above their level, why am I not having them at that level? <laughs> and at some point, that's just another phrase for I am under leveling and undervaluing my people. Uh, we need to keep the work more variable. A bunch of people said they're leaving because of novelty. Like we need to find ways to move people around. It's very tempting as a manager to keep people who are succeeding at their current sort of uh, responsibilities in those responsibilities, but we need to mix them up and for their own good and for our good. 
And finally, we also need to know when and how to let them go. I've had people from my who work for me as researchers go on to data engineering roles, UX design roles, PM roles. We need to. It is much better to have these people leave games user research but stay in the studio, stay in games. We need that institutional knowledge and all that experience. And so we need to find ways to say, like, okay, this person is drifting towards analytics. Can we find more mathy problems for them to? dig in on. They think they want to be a designer. Can we do an in-house sabbatical for the summer and let them spend two months being a junior designer? And then come and best case, they come back to us, haven't gotten out of the system. Worst case, they become a designer and they're still in the building where we can talk to them. And we already know they're good people that we want to work with. Okay. So that is the end of my dark, my dark and depressing deck. Uh, and I would love to hear your solutions. I have hopefully brought the problem into slightly more, uh, resolution for people to think about, but I would love to hear your thoughts and ideas for helping out with this. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of this data was collected fall of 2022. So before a lot of the return to office was really pushed. And most of these people left the industry before that. So that's probably a separate issue. I think it is, I mean, a lot of the return to office stuff is a soft layoff and we know that and that's a thing uh and it's going to have the same effect as any layoff we're going to lose good people Yeah. So the uh, co the question again to be start repeating these. So the question was uh, the comment was that she found it very useful to go in from games into another f version of tech, have experiences there, and bring them back to games. I think that's absolutely true. I selfishly don't want people to do that, and I also think like we all deal with churn and returning players. Uh, we saw Elizabeth Weiss talk earlier. Like every time someone churns, that's there's a chance they don't come back, and I think finding ways to do sort of controlled sabbaticals might be fun or like, or, and, or be just be really aggressive about bringing people back and be recognizing that, Hey, you've gone away and learn new things. We want you to come your, your room sprunga is over. We want you to come back and uh, be with us again. Yes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just need to go face other problems. Yes. Because there's problems everywhere. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you go to step other. Like you're basically exercising autonomy of doing so while you're starting and doing a lot better uh, after that. And I think, like, especially in the last while, there was huge incentive. It's like, well, okay, these people that are frustrated and want to like go somewhere else and face other problems and like be highly incentivized to not go to the game. feels like depending it's like within a company you need to have like a rotation yeah it's like okay this is and then there's like at a certain point like okay i'm gonna get back to my team i'm gonna go over here yeah this problem 
to them within the company, it's like, okay, I can't handle anymore the challenges of this company. It really seems like a, like a, like a, like a, like a trade, you know, like, <laughs> Yes. Yes. We will, we will trade you to blizzard and get for a player to be named later or something. Yes. Uh, so there are two parts to the comment to repeat it. Uh, one is that it is super frustrating to be faced with the same problems over and over. And there is sometimes genuine need for a change. And two, maybe we need to be, we can get that change within the industry rather than within uh, the same company. So yes, absolutely. And the cancer may be just like, if we fix the pay problem, that may be easier to get people back to come back to get people to find other move forward in other companies. Like I've certainly switched companies to get promotions before within games. And that is still as not as good as being able to get promoted and climb the ladder in the company you're at, but it is better than losing that expertise for good. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay, so the question is, uh, are there are there non job related things we could do for seniors, like social time and so on? I think the problem is that due to sort of the shape of our sort of demographic pyramid, we have a lot more juniors than seniors. So unless we explicitly gate off the space, that social space, it's going to end up with the seniors being a minority, and that doesn't feel great. It feels it feels. I mean, the SIG is less public than Twitter, but not by much. Yes. Yes, you. <laughs> no. Right. So Kirk is correctly pointing out that other specialties within games are <laughs> are also underpaid <laughs> and that we are expensive. And it's hard to argue for us to be even more expensive than we are when that money could be used to hire two artists or whatever. <laughs> yeah. James Berg is threatening to form a union. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Deborah? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah i agree with all of them actually uh so first you correctly point out that medlock is still active mike if you're watching i'm so sorry i should have called you out as a mentor that's still active um the okay okay never mind I take it back um, so Deborah correctly pointed out that most of these people are leaving are seen at senior level. Oh, at senior levels, I will finish this up and I'll get off stage. Uh, most of these people are leaving at senior levels, at which point, and we generally know seniors are better paid. And so this is the, the rich complaining that they're not richer. Like, yes, they are, uh, more senior, but they're also older. I think one of the things we're seeing here is life cycle it is relatively easy right out of college to not easy, but relatively easy to accept. I'm going to make 20% less. That gets rough when you're starting to pay for daycare and uh, mortgages and whatnot. So there's there may just be a life cycle thing that is people sort of hitting middle age concerns that they are wandering off and deciding that they really do need that little extra money. Um, there was other comment was that a lot of the people who are surviving at senior levels are forging their own path, and that's yes, and that is as I've also found that exhausting. And the good news is it's getting better every year. Like we used to not. Have, uh, I think the ghost wants me to stop talking. Uh, I will be out in the lobby if people have more questions and on the discord if you have online questions. Thank you very much.